Good evening and welcome to the June 15th, hard to believe, June, July, because it's July. <laughs> that was only to make everybody calm down. Um, the July 15th, 2014, Town Hall Meeting of the Town of Austin. And I want to thank everybody that came out tonight, and I want to thank the whole television audience too, because tonight's presentations is the start of the uh, residential uh, input into how we move forward with our police services for the next four years. As everyone's aware, oh, wait a minute, got to do the pledge. Everyone stand for the pledge. Please. Uh, 
expertise in certain specialties that we certainly could never provide, which they don't get enough credit for. About a month ago, somebody was doing some gardening down the south end of town, and a hand grenade rolled out of his, out of their garden. We called the county to show up. They're great. We, we depend on them for a long time. Briarcliff Manor shares our eastern boundary. Our relationship goes back to the, to the 19th century. And currently, we're working with them in an in a action investigation task force program where we train and we pull our resources together to investigate serious actions. So I'm not going to do that, but I am going to talk about my police department. This is the number one misconception about the Village of Boston Police Department. That is a graph of part one crimes. Part one crimes are the most serious crimes the FBI uses to track uh, criminal activity within different jurisdictions. In 1990, we had over a thousand serious crimes in the Village of Boston. In the 24 years since Chief Burton has taken over, we reduced it by 73%. And now it's under 300. We're not like we used to be at all, and it's uh, it's very very different. In addition to which, back in the 80s and early 90s, our crime was more focused in one particular area. Now our problems are more spread out throughout the entire village. So that that's the number one misconception I want to clear up tonight. I want to talk about a little bit about the history. My chief's a history buff. He loves it. Uh, contrary to popular belief, that's not me in the right hand the corner in the front. <laughs> That guy next to him does look a lot like Pete Carpenter, though. Uh, that's 1915 in front of 16 Croton Avenue right down here. We've been in business for 120 years. We've had three separate headquarters in that time. We've lost two officers in the line of duty. We've got a long history. This whole village is rich in history, and we're a part of it. Accreditation, we've been continuously accredited for 10 years. We're going through the process right now. Uh, we just had our inspection a couple weeks ago. We expect to be recredited sometime in September. And we're very proud of our language skills. Currently, we have 56 police officers. We speak nine separate languages. 14 of our officers are bilingual. In addition, we put technology into our front lobby that allows us to access the 911 language line through our front desk. We're pretty proud of that. We're local. We like to make up the police department from the community. A lot of the people, a lot of men, women that work in the police department grew up here, went to school here, live here, have cool school, uh, kids in the school system currently, over 50%. We think that's important and we really push it. And we hire off a local preferential list. The municipality is allowed to hire off an Austin list. We do, almost exclusively, except we take transfers. Tomorrow night we take the young lady we're from the town of Austin, lives in the village of Austin. We're swearing her in tomorrow night. That's a big deal for us. It's a big deal for us to reflect the community we're serving. And we feel the best way to do that is to hire from the community. We're big on training. We're really big on training. DCJS says you need 21 hours a year in service training. We're averaging over 80 uh, hours right now. Our trainers, our in-house trainers, are excellent. They're some of the best. They're one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, our police department is as good as it is. We're very proud to be associated with them. They put a tremendous amount of effort into it, and it's reflected in the way the police handle themselves. And we train locally. Last year, we used uh, Brookside School as a venue. We hosted a week-long rapid response drill in Brookside School itself. <laughs> We think that training in the local venues is critical because we think that local knowledge is essential. We're a natural fit because we're the home team. We're right here. As Ms. Donnelly was saying, the town is kind of draped over the outside of the village. In total, it's less than seven square miles. From north to south, the town and the village together are about four miles. East to west, together, they're about three months. The parks are scattered throughout both the town and the village. We think it's better to check, there, check the parks within your sector than instead of leave your sector and try and do it by town or village. I'll try and explain that later when we look at the map. We believe in response time, and response time is based all on sector discipline, 
we divide up the village and we're going to divide the town up by geographical sectors, and our men stay in those sectors. That's why we have such a fast response time. OVAC is the best in the business, and we beat them. We're very proud of that, and we maintain it. We have a 24-hour accessible local headquarters. That's us giving a tour right there. It's one of the nicer things we do. We give tours to just about every kid we can think of. Park school marches down once a year, every class. We give a tour to the whole police department. Right down there, we are accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do child seat installations there. You can come down and speak to a police officer there. We think it's important for simply located. Here's the maps I was referring to. The town RFP has requested two, two, and one. Two officers during the day tour, two officers in the 3 to 11, and, two office, and one officer at night on the midnight tour. In the left-hand screen, yeah, that's just, those are the town and the village sectors today. The green ones would represent the town. That's one officer in each sector. In the village, it's at least one officer in what we call Sector 3 in North Town Avenue, Sector 4 Croton Avenue, two downtown, and one patrol sergeant on the road with a desk officer. Bare minimum. That's day tours and three to 11s. On the right is the midnight tour. Currently, the RFP requests one officer out there for the, for the town. That's what we give them. And we have one officer ourselves, a patrol sergeant on the road, and two other officers available. We think that our proximity, our ability to back people up, our ability to share that boundary, is critical. We think that's a huge advantage for us. We think it's a natural fit. We think that we're serving one community. Everybody in this room has a story about someone coming up and saying, you the town of the village. Is this in the town or is this in the village? It wasn't too long ago people would ask me, what's the difference between the town and the village? There is a difference. There are, in some respects, separate community. However, in many ways, they're the same. We share the same school system. Our line is difficult. I've lived and worked here for 50 years. I'd be hard pressed to put my foot on the line in certain places. The line goes through one of my officers' living rooms. You know, some places upstate, it's pretty common for a county agency to do the rural area on the outside, and municipal agencies to do the more built up areas inside. That isn't the case here. There is no clear demarcation between the two. It's a natural blend. We think it should be one police department. We think one, one police department for the school system is important too. Those three years up at middle school are critical. We don't want to lose contact with the kids. We pick them up in park school. We follow them all the way until when they graduate. We think those three years are important. And we want to be there. We like long-term relationships. We've known people 10, 20, 30 years, we want to keep that up. I can't even talk about community outreach because there's so much, but please look at the brochure and you can see some of the things, some of the many things that we do. For some people, this is the bottom line. Those are our projected costs. That's what we place for the RFP. People have asked me why the first year is higher than the second year. That's a good question. The easy answer is those are startup costs. We run very lean. For us to, to do this, we hire five people January 1st from the town of Austin, village of Austin list. But while, while they're in the academy, until they become manpower, we have to cover them until they become manpower for me sometime in late August. So that accounts for the, the initial bump. The next year they become manpower and we drop down again. We're very lean, we stretch it. Very long dollar, and that's a good example of it. This is the total savings over four years. Like I said, we do a lot of outreach. We're very proud of it. We're very proud of the officers who do it here. Please take a look at that and, and judge for yourself. Thank you so much.
uh, introduce his team from Westchester County. Good evening. Uh, with me this evening is my Deputy Commissioner Joe Yazinski, Chief Inspector Mark McGlynn of our Administrative Services Division, Chief John Hodges, who's got Field Services, Chief uh, Inspector Tom Gleason, who is uh, being Officer of Patrol, uh, Lieutenant Alonji, who most people from the town are familiar with, he's up here quite a bit, and Sergeant Jeffrey Weiss from Planning and Technology, who's going to give a presentation this evening. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeffrey Weiss, the Sergeant uh, with the Westchester County Department of Public Safety. I'm with the uh, Planning and Technology Unit. Uh, very good. How's that? Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, about your local police department. Uh, to the extent that what you're considering is the future of policing in the unincorporated part of the town of Austin. I suggest that the future is now, because the county police have been serving the unincorporated portion of the town of Austin for three and a half years now. We've been patrolling uh, the town uh, in accordance with a patrol plan, so, uh, just as the one that's uh, in the uh, request for proposal, where we'll have uh, two cars on days and evenings and one car on the midnights. And that's the task we've been performing for the last three years. We've been performing it with a core group of police officers, um, about 10 of them who are regularly assigned in the town of Austin. Um, their relief comes from a pool of approximately 25 police officers, all with specific knowledge and experience in the town. In addition, we presently and will continue to provide investigative service with one detective dedicated to service in the town. As I said, in accordance with the RFP and in accordance with the current patrol plan, uh, we have two officers working days and evenings and one on the midnights uh, in, in this sector plan. Uh, the uh, A and B sectors are divided along Route 134. And again, we maintain our response times also uh, with the, by maintaining sector discipline. The um, one car in each of the, each of the sectors, except on the midnight, one one car comes both. And as your local police department, we've been providing ongoing community service programs. We've continued the long-standing York Cop program, as well as the dark house monitoring, the homeowners association liaison false alarm monitoring, as well as community education and outreach that were begun by the Town of Austin Police Department before our arrival three and a half years ago. In addition, during our tenure, we've been responsive to the town government and the community, frequently meeting with the town supervisor and frequently meeting with community members. Our public police interface consists of a number of items. Uh, first of all, 911 for emergencies, our non-emergency telephone number, um, the availability of police officers, detectives, and supervisors to meet with uh, residents at the location of their choosing, at their home or business, or if for some reason they would desire at, at our own headquarters. In addition, we are accessible through town elected officials who uh, ultimately administer the contract for police services as well as through the town of Longy, who is the county police liaison for the town of Austin, and any other member of the county police administration. Among the services that we provide together with our patrol investigative services uh, in the town um, are communications. Our communications center handles call taking and dispatching. It's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week with multiple communications operators who are able to handle multiple incidents at any particular time. In addition, our communication center is supervised by a sergeant or lieutenant desk officer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our communication system is equipped uh, with, uh, they call it an alley system, that uh, automatically determines the phone number of a caller and the location of the call in the event that the caller is unable to communicate. Lastly, our communication center is uh, ABL equipped, ABL is automatic vehicle 
automatic vehicle locator. Each of our police vehicles is equipped with a GPS transmitter, which permits our communications operators and through them our supervisors to know where those vehicles are at any given time. In addition, of course, there's supervision. We have a sergeant who's the first line supervision um, who will supervise our police officers in the field 24 7. Uh, in addition, uh, should that particular should a particular supervisor be tied up on a particular incident uh, in town, for example, and there should be a second incident in town, we would send a second backup supplemental first line supervisor. Uh, in addition, we have second line and command level supervision. We have a lieutenant uh, available 24 7 on duty, um, and in addition, uh, we have a captain or hire who will either be on duty or on call 24 7. <coughs> Just a little bit more about the Department of Public Safety, uh, known more colloquially as the County Police. We are 270 sworn members uh, who stand behind uh, those who are assigned to the town patrol, uh, in addition to 50, 50, excuse me, 70 civilian members. And together we provide uh, in town and throughout the county uh, uniform patrol services, investigative services, special operations services, as well as administrative and support services. We are an accredited agency, accredited by the uh, New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services Law Enforcement Accreditation Program. We've been accredited since uh, 1994. Um, accreditation, among other things, acknowledges the implementation of a given police agency of uh, policies that are conceptually sound and operationally effective. Uh, in addition, the county police has a history of contracted police services. In addition to having served the town of Austin for the last three and a half years, uh, we provide patrol services in the town of Portland, and we also provide uh, under contract school resource officers, patrols for the state parkways, as well as the Department of Social Services. In addition to the uh, specific services uh, which we've been providing uh, for the unincorporated portion of the town of Austin, uh, those dedicated services come along with the full complement of other resources of the Department of Public Safety, uh, which I will not read off to you, but uh, they are there for you and available uh, when the handout is posted. Our specialized services are also close to the community. Members of our special response team, uh, our canine personnel, uh, and, the, and their handlers. <laughs> They're assigned throughout our patrol services, so they, they may be some assigned within or nearby the towns so that they would be available. In addition, uh, our emergency services unit is available and on duty 24-7, and it's kept in a location on Central. Just a little bit of a refresher for those who are familiar, and uh, for those and also for those who aren't familiar about the contract policing model, uh, how we got here in the first place when we first uh, uh, engaged with the town three and a half years ago. Uh, the concept was raised to do this as a contracted uh, contracted police services, and in the contract model, the town chooses the level of police services that it wants and for which it's willing to pay. And in our case, the county is obligated to provide specifically those services. So when the contract calls for two cars uh, on days and evenings, there are two cars on days and evenings. Um, they are, regardless of our obligations within the rest of the county, we will have those two cars servicing the town at all times. Um, and the town, of course, maintains control because of the legal obligations of the We've provided here in, in uh, copies of, of a sheet uh, to the uh, board members um, of our uh, estimated cost detail. Uh, you've seen the uh, 
you see the total cost of the uh, in the in the bid uh, of our proposal. And um, just to let you know a little bit about how that's arrived at, first of all, I'll tell you that with two police officers on days, two police officers on evenings, and one police officer on the midnights, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, the total number of police officers needed to fulfill that are 10. We'll also be providing, as we've been all along throughout our contractual relationship, one detective assigned to town investigations. The way the contract is, and the way the bid price was arrived at, was by determining our best estimate of what our actual costs are, because the costs are required to be cost neutral to the county, so that taxpayers throughout the county aren't forced to subsidize the cost of police in the town of Austin. So, what we've done over the next couple of sheets is we've laid out our projections of costs going forward four years. Now, we have people in our county budget office who are very particular about how we estimate these costs, and one of the things they are is they're particularly conservative in their estimates, in that they don't want us to be surprising the town at the end of the year and saying, well, we estimated our cost to be X, and it's actually X plus some significant number. Uh, and in point of fact, over the course of the last uh, three full contract years that we've had, uh, we have provided the service for under the budget of the now. <coughs> in conclusion, I'd like to say, first of all, again, county police have been your police here in, in the uh, up north in the unincorporated uh, portion of the town of Austin for the last three and a half years. Uh, I remind everyone that all of the former town police officers were hired by the county police, and many of them are still part of our town police patrol. All of the community policing programs which are being conducted by the town of Austin police are presently being continued by the county police. In addition, the county police have been working closely with the town government and community groups to ensure that its law enforcement expectations are being met. It's our understanding that over the past three and a half years, the residents have been satisfied with county police services, uh, and we have been and will continue to be responsive to the needs and desires of the community with respect to their police services. And I thank you for your time and attention. very much. Um, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to ask any board members if they have any questions because we did receive, <coughs> let me just make it clear how we're going to handle this whole thing. This is the presentation stage by the Village of Austin and Westchester County. Tonight you'll be able to come up and, and speak as you can do at any town hall meeting and we will also be receiving, if you want to send a letter or an email to S. Donnelly, S E O N N E L L Y, at townofaustin.com. If you prefer not to get up and speak, or if you're on, watching this on television, if you want to um, put your comments on paper, uh, it really does help, or in an email. If you don't email, then just simply either drop it off at the office or mail it in the U.S. mail. We get U.S. mail every day. So, oh, thank God, he's going to turn the air conditioning. So it's a little warm in here. Oh, lights. Can we turn the air conditioning on a little more, too? <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a green building. <laughs> um, so, uh, do you want to start, uh, Kim? Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Kim Jeffrey. Um, I guess I, I can start with the Austin Police Department since that's who went first. Um, I actually live in the unincorporated town, so I speak not just as a board member, but a resident. Um, and I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I know that uh, the community itself is 
uh, interested in um, continuing our uh, quality of life type of community policing. I think that becomes um, the bulk of the issues from the people that I know who's unincorporated, do we agree that tends to be what, what happens. Um, and so I see that you're extensively trained. I, I saw that in our feed. Um, do you have any particular community policing type of training or discussions or in-house? How, how does that turn into work? Translate. Translate for training to Um, as to community policing training, uh, I first have to say that community policing is actually organic with the Village of Boston and Police Department. I started in 1985 in New York City Transit uh, Police Department, and let me tell you, it was a very different type of policing that was necessary there as compared to when I transferred here to the Village of Boston. Uh, right around that time, community policing became um, a little more, it was spoken of more commonly. Uh, as something to get back to. Historically, the cop on the beat, everybody knew his name, we knew everybody in the neighborhood. When I came to Austin, I think that was already happening. Okay, that's how policing is done here. As to formal schools, uh, we regularly uh, send a variety of our officers, supervisors, trainers, and general patrol uh, to various different training uh, venues. Uh, some sponsored by DCJS, uh, some by private entities that are supported by universities. And the training is ongoing. And other training is incorporated uh, into that community policing model. Um, we have, uh, how many bicycle officers we have at this point? We just, uh, 15 bicycle officers. 25. 25, we have, uh, Jeff, how many uh, motorcycle officers? 10. 10 motorcycle officers. Um, and they are regularly out there. Uh, we man foot posts. Possible. We are a very community-oriented police department, so that training is ongoing. It's not even extra training that we're getting. It's just part of what we do on a regular basis. And it is further supported with the additional training. This is when new ideas come out. Like I said, I'll be the first one to steal a good idea and take credit for it and use it for ourselves. Um, you know, if it's good and it works, uh, we're going to try it and see how it applies to the community in Austin. Uh, and those standards are the same things we're going to carry over should we um, be chosen uh, for the contract with the town outside. Did, that, did I answer your question? I, I think you did. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, I have a separate question with respect to um, patrolling the school system. Um, we have had a... a uh, I, I actually don't claim to know how the Westchester County Police have been patrolling. So I don't want to speak on their behalf. I just wonder how it is you do it in the other schools and what you would envision for AMB. Okay, I'll let uh, Dennis Levesque answer that question. Hi, thanks. Um, as part of our general patrol, patrol procedures, we have every single officer in every sector on every tour walking through any school that's in their that's in their sector. So if you're in sector one, you're walking through Park School every single day. If you're in sector three, you're going through Claremont School every single day. And as part of this program, AMD would fall in sector three. Uh, also in sector three would be St. Augustine School, because the town does have two schools in their, in their area. Um, as far as things like, I know that in your question you mentioned the school resource officer. Right now, the proposal called for coverage for the town in one detective. That's what we've budgeted for. Uh, but we would be completely open to creative solutions. Uh, there's a possibility that we could take the detective sergeant and make him the point of contact for town investigations, and we could spread the rest of that, those resources into putting patrol officers as things like liaisons in the school or things like DARE, and, uh, you know, not necessarily a school resource officer, but as a youth officer, and we could bolster that program. We have a number of DARE officers that, uh, that teach in all the schools, and, uh, as a general part of our, our patrol division, uh, involvement in the schools is, is a big commitment for us. So if you check with your kids and you ask them about what police officer came to school today, almost every day they should be able to name somebody that's been through there. And every day they will be able to name somebody that's been through there. Because we're in the schools on a constant basis. Thank you. Um, I think my last question for now. 
experience with the police department, uh, local guy, three kids in the district. With regards to 911, uh, there's there's two pieces to that puzzle. There's the, the call taker, whether it's uh, cellular 911, uh, E911, which is uh, your landline, or your regular telephone numbers, uh, 5700, which is our emergency line, and 499. Um, taking the call in is, is, is one part. And there's an improvement that could be had uh, if, uh, if there was a change made. Because in 2005, when uh, the town of Austin moved to their own uh, headquarters and started to dispatch for themselves, uh, and they went away from our dispatch, they made a change. They changed something that had already been in place for well over 70 years. Since the advent of radio cars and telephones, we dispatched the town of Austin Police Department. We also shared the building. Um, when they did that, uh, we remained the primary dispatch for the Austin Fire Department and the Austin Volunteer Ambulance Board. Now, that remains in place today. And uh, initially in 2005, when the town moved, they had to, when they would receive a call from the town resident for medical services or fire, they would speak to the person, get their information, and then they would make a phone call themselves to us, and we would dispatch the ambulance board and the fire department. Now, that's an added phone call. An added phone call is anywhere between 40 seconds and a minute. And we know that in you know, these times, moments like that are uh, precious. So that continues to this day, unfortunately, and, and, and you know, there's limitations to equipment and calls and things like that. Uh, but if you were to come back to us, we'd be able to eliminate that second phone call that needs to be made and make that dispatch immediately uh, while the phone, you know, the phone is on his ear. The officer is able to push the button and dispatch the fire department and or the ambulance call directly. The other piece of the puzzle is the radio dispatch stuff. Now, like I already said, we uh, previously dispatched the town of Austin Police Department for 70 some odd years. We also dispatched the ambulance force since it was formed from our own auxiliary police department back in the 50s. As well as the Austin Fire Department, when they began uh, being radio dispatched, we dispatched them. So a lot of history there. Uh, there's an unfortunate uh, time lapse that's occurring now, and something that we can fix uh, January 1st as soon as it, the switch is. I'd like to, uh, may I respond to that? I just need to uh, actually do justice to that, uh, to, to the dispatching 911. Uh, my name is John Hodges. I'm the uh, Chief of Field Services for uh, Westchester County PD. And actually, Mr. Janicki, you're out here. You have done a tour with us down at Communications. <laughs> I want, I mean, I just, just, just pointing out what, but just to clarify, 911 calls, two separate venues, cell phone calls all go to the TMC down in Hawthorne. All landline calls go to a pre-designated location that's programmed, whether it goes to the town, which now goes to the county PD, the village goes to the village PD. They're pre-programmed into the system. Fire EMS, there's buttons that are right there. The calls, I, I just want to point out, I think the 30, 40, 60 second delay is being a little bit overstated, only because E911 is the enhanced 911 system. So if the call is fire EMS, it's a push of a button, the person stays on the line, the call goes directly in. And then the dispatch of the call goes out. But those are two di distinctly different uh, mechanisms for cell phone calls, and those calls sometimes have a tendency, if they go to TMC, they can be undetermined. 
And the key with those is making sure that you can then, as Jeff pointed out, make sure that you know where the caller is if they go off the line so that you can ping it and get the GPS coordinates. But just to clarify, those are the, the two distinct mechanisms for uh, your 911 calls. No, no, I just want to clarify because I don't think I understood, I don't think I understood all of that. But okay, we can we can continue another time. I uh, good, uh, good evening, I'm Eric Guaja, and uh, I want to thank both the, uh, the village police and the county police, uh, not just for coming here tonight, but for uh, helping us and our community feel so secure and safe. Um, I. I'm very pleased with all the services in the village and the town, and, um, and I think I speak for the whole community that, uh, that your efforts are greatly appreciated, so thank you very much. Um, of course, safety and security are of primary importance, but in looking over the, uh, the responses to the RFP, it jumps off the page that there is a significant bottom line differential there, and I was just going to ask, um, that maybe uh, one representative from the village uh, respond to what you think that how you are able to provide services equivalent or better services if you feel that's the case for um, an average of approximately eight hundred dollars less <laughs> per year and are you actually missing something? For example, is there overtime or other items that were requested that have not been properly addressed in the response? And I'd like to then ask if perhaps the uh, county could speak to what it is, and I appreciate the conservative approach. Any budgetary uh, group and board appreciates a conservative approach because nobody likes to be surprised at the end of the year. So I take that into consideration very strongly, so thank you for that. Um, but what is it that you think it, it, for the county uh, would um, account for the higher bottom line figure? Um, so, okay, and I'll, and I'll follow up, if, if I may have one follow up question for the county after that. Uh, let me, well, I'll try and explain it. Um, we're not a large agency, we're only 56 sworn. Uh, we can't hire 10 police officers can't do that because then we can't get rid of 10 police officers in four years if we had to. So what we did was we, we designed a staffing chart based on new hires. New hires and overtime. And both of which are cheaper than police officers. And we had a philosophical discussion within the, within the village of what we're going to do with those savings. And the bottom line for us was the only reason we're doing it is for the town RFP. So we took all those savings, we passed them on to you. So we're doing, we're doing our staffing, we're passing on the things that we are, the money we are realizing by with new hires, five new hires, and over time, we're passing it directly on to you. The numbers are real. The village manager's office has gone over it. We're being conserved as well. We'd be doing our own village disservice if we weren't. That's all I can say about our staff. So just to follow up, I just want to follow up and then the county can speak. Um, as a truing up at the end of the year, what happens? Uh, how do you how do you perceive a true and a truing up means that everyone sits down and says what were the costs, um, what were the actual costs compared to the budget, and then you sit down and you talk about it. Hopefully, and I, I will tell you that it has been. I was very relieved that it, um, it has been money coming. Not significant money, but money coming back to the town so far. So just that. You know, what is your, the philosophy, the village's philosophy, going to be on true or not? I don't know. I read that uh, yesterday. I wasn't even familiar with that term. With the exception of some... Well, that's why it's wrong. With the exception of some unforeseen catastrophe, I see it being pretty, pretty much exactly what we said it would be. I really have to, village manager, also have to speak to you about the actual process, but that's about all I know about. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk real complicated about 911 lines and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to speak very plain language. The distinction of the two contracts with the disparity in the price is essentially the cost of the personnel. The personnel is the most expensive thing, obviously, in your budget, my budget, and Austin's budget. 
When you do a study of how many people you need to police the town of Boston, and there are formulas and studies to determine manpower commitments, you come up with 11 people. The other proposal is offering five people. When you eliminate half of your force, of course the price is going to go down, and it's that simple. Yeah, and, and the follow-up, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner. Uh, the follow-up is, there was, there was mention of uh, not being able to uh, subsidize, uh, you know, the, the, the county couldn't subsidize any savings for us, and I'm not sure I fully understood that. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to sort of elaborate on that. Does that mean that, that, that you're not allowed to give special pricing to us? I mean, if the, if, the, if the cost per, you know, if the costs are lower, does that mean you can't go lower because you're providing the same services for a higher amount to a different community? I, I just didn't really fully get it. Happy to explain. The tax levy in Westchester County is paid for by every municipality in Westchester. So if we were to do this at a disadvantage to the county, there would be implications for every other municipality would be essentially paying taxes to the county to police the town of Austin. That's why it has to remain cost neutral. Just to, to, just to supplement what the commissioner said, in answer, in answer to your, your question also, when I said the county can't supplement, can't um, subsidize it, whatever it actually costs to provide the service, is what is what the town pays for the service. So if it's provided, if, as has happened across the term of the last three and a half years, we've been providing the service at a cost less than we anticipated. So therefore, the town realizes the savings. So that's why I mean, if we if it costs X dollars, at the end of the day, when we when we true up at the end of the year and we say, okay, we put X number of police officers, X number of hours, this was our bottom line cost for providing the service in the town. Town pays for exactly what was provided. Right? So, if, for example, we we anticipate it'll be X number of hours of overtime, and it turns out we don't do X number of hours of overtime, and it's less overtime, then it's less cost to the, to the town. So, if there's if it's, if the service is provided more cheaply to the town, then the town does pay less. But the town doesn't pay less than it actually costs to provide the service, because to do so would require other taxpayers to shoulder the burden. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first, for Sergeant, who made the presentation? Very nicely done, by the way. Um, you mentioned during that uh, conversation that you uh, that the uh, uh, county police that are handling our current contract um, are satisfied with how they get services. How, how did you assess that? Oh, that the, that the town residents are satisfied with the yeah. services we're providing? How, how did you how did you gain that knowledge? Well, uh, I'll pass it on to Lieutenant Galan. I want you to make any specific uh, examples, but uh, I know that the, we, we have had uh, relatively few, uh, if any, uh, complaints about our services. And we have received some recommendations from uh, within the town, but I'm going to let Lieutenant Galanji answer that specifically. I need to get the picture sooner or later. Um, that's pretty much it. Hi everybody, I'm Nick Alonji, County PD, and Lieutenant Lee Liaison to the Town of Austin. Um, I'm sure some of you know me, maybe some of you don't. Uh, basically how we kind of assess that is, um, I made a point when we first came to the town, when we first uh, started uh, policing the Town of Austin, when I started getting up here talking about coyotes and storm preparedness. Um, and any other kind of emails or anything I send, is I make sure that I always give my phone number, my email address. Um, Obviously, we have a direct line in the headquarters. Everyone in dispatch knows exactly who to, who to direct calls to. My email's out there. My email's on the town website. Um, somebody saw my email uh, somewhere else, too. I forgot what they were saying. Uh, some other website. But basically, I'm, uh, yeah, I know. But um, basically, I'm very easy to get a hold of. And uh, I gotta tell you, listen, the people in the town of Austin, uh, they're not afraid to speak their mind. They come right out and they say things like, hey, I don't like this. Hey, I like that. That's great. That's not. So 
when people have had uh, something to say, maybe a minor gripe or something, maybe not a gripe, but something they say, hey, you know what, that's great, but can we do it this way? Or hey, you know, for my street, I'd rather have it done this way. Uh, they're not afraid to call me and tell me or shoot me an email. All right? Um, how many of those have I gotten, quite frankly? I mean, if I could open up my email inbox and show you, I would, so you can go through it. Maybe that could be arranged. But uh, slim to none. Uh, we really haven't gotten any, any complaints. We really haven't gotten any gripes. You know, when we started, one or two little bumps, of course, to say, hey, you know, can we do this better? And we say, okay, no problem, and we do it. And we go back, we get feedback, say, hey, what do you think about that? Is that good? And they say, yeah, no, that's good. Or, hey, maybe do it a little bit different. So my point is, as verbose as I always am, is that haven't gotten a lot of poor feedback. All right? Gotten a lot of positive feedback. I do have those emails. And I'll, I save the bad and the good. I save all my emails pretty much in my, in my Austin email folder. Um, in, accordance with, right, in accordance with the county policy. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we've... We've made a lot of good relationships. We've had a, 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 a lot of compliments, a lot of attaboys, quite frankly. And uh, any time there has been a little uh, problem here or there, we've taken care of it. You know, that's uh, anyone who knows me. I see a few familiar faces. They know. They know what that's all about. I don't. I don't suffer a lot of uh, nonsense. And I make sure that our people are doing what they're supposed to do. And I, I think people have been pretty appreciative of that all across the board. One last question. I'm still not. I'm still not sure I understand on the on the bottom line. They just the, there's a two and a two and a one. Both both teams said the two two one. But as far as the, as far as the staffing, I don't understand how how the village is at ten is at five and the town and the county is at. 10. Let me just see if I can clarify it a little bit further. Because police officers work seven days a week. Obviously, one person can't work 365 days a year. So when we calculate vacation time, average sick time, you know, other types of leave, military leave, etc., we take that off the total number of working days of one police officer. So one police officer to fill one shift, you need two police officers to do it. Okay? So for each one of those blocks where you see there's going to be two people on, on the day tour, you have to hire four people to do that. Two people on 4 to 12, you have to hire four people to do that. One person on the midnight, you have to hire two people to do that. That's why our proposal uh, lists 11 proposed personnel numbers. Uh, I think what the captain's trying to explain is he plans to do it a different way with overtime. I think that's the distinction. In addition to which, uh, by, doing, by hiring five new officers, we're going to incur savings over three years based on the fact that their contract starts lower than a normally paid police officer. But I want to give you my numbers guy. He can probably help you better than me. Hi. Um, so we spent a lot of time going over this, and we came up with a lot of different models. But at the end of the day, what we're obligated to provide is that two two and one service, two on the day tour, two on the three eleven, one on the midnight. The commissioner is absolutely correct. The number is 11. We need two guys to cover because one guy's off, the other guy has to be in. But the difference between us and the county what we're talking about. First of all, the county has significantly higher salaries than us. The base salary for the Stroma is just plain more than the village base. I'm sorry. The salary for county employees is substantially higher than what the village pays. If you look at the numbers that were on there, the numbers that they have down for medical insurance, I know that that's higher than what our medical insurance costs. So when you tally up all these different things, that's going to give you substantial savings. What the commissioner is referring to when we're talking about hiring less people, we're not doing it with less bodies. What we're doing is, we're going to hire five new people. And when you hire a new cop, it takes four years to get them up the top salary. So obviously in the first four years of the contract, we're going to reap a lot of benefit from that, all of which we're passing on to the town. In the second year where it goes down even lower, it's because we're no longer covering that stuff on overtime. We're not hiding. We're going to cover some of those posts on overtime. It's cheaper to pay somebody that's an existing employee overtime than it is to hire a new cop, a new cop that has to have a retirement funded has to have medical benefits for their family, has to have all those payroll taxes paid. There's still taxes and costs included in the cost of a, a, an existing employee, but it's substantially lower. So the way that we're able to staff the exact same thing that the county has, it's precisely the same amount of coverage that you're getting from their contract for a significant savings. It's just to do some of it with overtime. 
And I think the key, the bottom line, is that this is the by the passing on savings of the I, I just have, I just have, well, you just answered one of my questions. But it, I, I don't, I still, I don't understand uh, one police officer on the night shift. I know you say you have two. I, I know in case one is out and the other one comes in. But you, it, one officer does the strolling all night alone? Yes, sir. That's what the RFP requested. Okay. <laughs> that, that don't sound good to me, but okay. That's a make it better. I'm just saying. But okay. Now, there is the, um, the officer in the school. The officer in the school, when, when you patrol the school once a day, you just go up and let the uh, the, the students see you, uh, uh, what, how is that? Well, currently we do two things. First of all, every one of our sectors, sector cars, is assigned to walk through every school in their sector every day, regardless of who that police officer is. So that's once a day? At least. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we have a youth officer who's in the schools on a regular basis now. We have five schools are responsible for it. You have two in your jurisdiction. Currently in the five, that's what we do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what else you say? I just didn't get to say thank you to both before it goes out to the audience. I, I really do appreciate these presentations, and I, I truly appreciate the answers as we've been going forward, and you're going to have to answer a whole lot, I'm sure. But I want to thank you so much for your clarity, both sides. You're very professional. We really do appreciate you being here. So in order to give the audience as much time as possible, um, we do ask you that you respect the other people in the audience when you come up to speak. Um, if you want to uh, you can sit with us, if you want to, or you can, okay. Because <laughs> we like to see the people at the mic too. Um, but if you'd like to come up and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please come up and um, give your name, your address, and um, and then ask your questions, but please be respectful of other people in the audience. And as I said before, if you don't feel like coming up tonight, you want to ask questions, you want to give a comment, um, then please feel free to send an email or a letter or drop it off at the office. So who would like to be the first person to come up? Okay, just come up to the microphone, please. Chief Hodges has uh, already started. I'm sorry, Bill, will you give your name? <laughs> sorry. He said Bill Daddy. Uh, the rest of it was 12 Morningside Court and the town outside. Uh, these presentations have been incredibly professional, both sides, and, and I think it's very tough for people like me, with a lot of white hair, who's been through a lot of competitive presentations, to make a decision. So congratulations to, to all of you participated in that. Uh, Sue, you know I sent to you an earlier mm -hmm. very lengthy uh, comment in writing uh, and I'm not going to go through that now. I'm just going to hit the high points. Uh, one of the high points um, involves why uh, Chief Hodges knows me. Uh, I took a ride along for those of you who don't know that term, it's an opportunity for a civilian to spend a shift with an officer on patrol in his patrol car, or her patrol car. And you learn a lot of stuff that you could never imagine by just listening to presentations and slides and so forth. And you really get immersed into the process of policing. And it starts with getting a Kevlar jacket on, which gets your attention. And uh, then you go out and you spend uh, the best part of eight hours, and the officer in, in charge of, of that uh, group uh, explains very well uh, everything that's going on. So I would encourage people to take it uh, right along, um, especially people who are in a position to make a decision on this. 
And it is an investment of the best part of the shift, and, uh, but it's interesting, it's entertaining, and it's worthwhile. Um, the, uh, there's been some comment in the past about response time. I think it's largely died down, but I would like to say that we have had first-hand experience with response time by the county police. Uh, my wife got a case of shingles, and for those of you who know that, it's a horrible disease, very contagious. And she had to, we had to put in a 911 call, uh, and I can tell you in two minutes, the county police, county police, were at our door ahead of OVAC. And it was just a tremendous response. And anybody who says that their response is slow or we don't see them, where are they? All I can say is they should try opening their eyes and they'll get a, a pretty good view of, of what's going on. Um, there are a couple of concerns I have and you can sort of address. Uh, sh uh, shared dispatch. Uh, some of you who are old enough will remember that the village used to dispatch the town outside. Uh, and there was some hard feeling about whether or not the town was getting equal treatment to the village calls. Uh, and that led to John Shavokas taking that function in-house, adding a police officer uh, at great cost, and it was a, I believe it was a terrible mistake. And I would like to encourage, um, so if you would uh, demand a, a good system of accountability uh, for the village, if the village is going to do the dispatching, just how can we be assured that we will not be you know, second tier to the village's own call? Um, that's very important. We had a horrible experience. Uh, our knee-jerk reaction was, was terrible. And let's not make the same mistake again. Um, similar situation, although I, I don't really know how to draw you out, and that is shared supervision. Um, you're going to have split supervision, you're going to have <laughs> town outside supervision, you're going to have uh, village or county supervision, um, and how that all comes together. Who makes the final decision when there's a dispute over some supervisory practice like coverage? Um, that's something that I would encourage you to, to uh, dig into. Uh, finally, um, the school resource officer, we touched on that uh, a couple of times. I personally believe this is one of the most important functions that the police can provide. When a police officer goes into AMD, for example, and actually goes into the cafeteria and has lunch with the kids, which has been a practice, I believe, or at least I've been told, uh, it used to be. Um, that not only introduces stability and calm into the cafeteria, it also gets the kids to understand that the police officer is a friend. It's not, the police officer is not an adversary. And kids who are in, the, in their late preteen years and early teen years, to have that kind of exposure, I think sets a great example for later on in life that the police officer is, is not your enemy. What happened in Jersey City you know, a couple of days ago was one of the most horrible things that has ever happened that I've ever read about in the paper. The police officer was ambushed and, and, and murdered. Uh, that resulted in part because a lot of people in the community hold the police officer as adversaries. And the school resource officer is, is key as far as I'm concerned, how we spread the cost of that is still an issue. Uh, but I hope it's not going to be lost. And that's all I, I really have to, uh, to say. Uh,
There was one last thing. We talked about dispatching and the, all the electronics and pushing the button as they track the patrol car and so forth. Some of us actually understood that. Um, it's what they have in the fourth one uh, headquarters is Star Wars. And I was blown away by the demonstration of how control, command and control is used by the uh, dispatcher and the supervision over the uh, police cars uh, out on, uh, on patrol. So uh, uh, that is something that I think is terrific. There may be something that uh, is as good in the village. I just don't know. I've been exposed to it. So anyway, uh, thank you for the opportunity to make my comments. And um, whatever we come up with, I think we're going to wind up with the, the town outside ahead of the game from where we were four or five years ago. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, I'm Jerry Gershner. I live at 42 Stonegate Road in the town outside. A couple of questions. The uh, county was saying that at the end of the year they looked at their expenses and they only charged us what the expenses were. Are we talking about a, co a contract that has a fluctuating cost or a contract that has a fixed cost? It is what it is. Now, what happens at the end of the year is it's chewing up, so if they don't use the overtime um, that they have uh, projected, then or um, or any other the other services if they come in less, then then we get the, uh, the difference back. It's called they call it a chewing up. Oh, uh, what about if it goes the other way? Well, it hasn't as of yet, and they're very uh, conservative, and we do meet all the time to make sure that um, we're all on target. So that, and we would continue that with whichever police department that we had, the, the town board and uh, the supervisor the administration meets with um, the uh, police liaisons a lot. Well, this sounds to me like it's not a fixed price bid. Well, it's a fixed price bid. It, it, if you had something, God forbid, happen that was, a, as, as even as the captain said, that was a disaster in your community, we would all have to sit down and all of these, how much funds could be uh, put in. You have to remember too that the county, whether it's the village of Austin, the village of Briarcliff, Broken or anything, is the second line of uh, support for all the police departments too out there too. Captain so, Craven, would that go with your proposal too? Is this a fungible number or it's, it's a fixed guarantee, that's what it is? <laughs> It was my impression that it was fixed unless there was some catastrophe. Yeah. But quite frankly, that would be the village manager's offices. So, so no matter, I mean, it's just like if you had your own police department and you had a catastrophe, uh, God forbid, you are going to um, have to react to that catastrophe and take care of it because it's first responders. It is a little bit of a confusing issue, but uh, what you have to realize is that many of the numbers can't be projected with certainty because collective bargaining units don't get, collective bargaining agreements don't get resolved into the future. So the captain, either the captain or I, know what we're going to be paying our people three years from now. Those contracts aren't settled. Does, it, does that make sense to you? Well, Captain Craven, are you bid? Is yours a fixed price number on labor, no matter what your contract? I think, I don't think you don't even have a contract at the moment. I'm no, simply, no. I'm simply making a projection. <coughs> we, built, we built into the estimate what we, what we thought would be the most conservative uh, price raise for personnel. And you're guaranteeing that price? Short of catastrophe, yes. All right, so if the contract gets negotiated and it comes in higher, that's the village's problem? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm really trying to pin down the question. As to whether, well, I whether, think, I can, think, whether I can, whether there's a grain of salt attached to these numbers. Sir, if I may, um, if this, if, if Westchester County were a private enterprise rather than rather than a government entity, we could say, okay, we're a business, and and we're going to put a fixed number out there, and we take the risk. 
because we're a private entity and we're only talking about our, our money. So I could come to you and I could say, sir, I'm going to provide you this service for $1 million and that's what it will cost you come hell or high water because I'm a private entity and I'm going to give you my best guess at my number and if I guess wrong, I go out of business. On the other hand, I represent Westchester County and all of the taxpayers in the county just as the folks from the Austin Police Department represents the village of Austin. And for either of us to come in here and say that it's going to be this number from hell or high water, well, if the hell and high water comes, that means every taxpayer in the county is subsidizing the service for this particular area. And that would be a dis that would be all right, that would be a disservice to the taxpayers, be they the taxpayers of the county at large or the taxpayers of the village of Austin. Would it be fair to call the number you presented a budget estimate rather than a bid? Um, you know, I don't want to quibble with the terms of art, but in point of fact, we put out our estimate. It's probably descriptive. I don't, I don't want to get down by the any particular legal definition, but that is descriptive. We say this is the costs as we know them. These, we know what the man hours are required for providing certain services. We know that given the variances in law enforcement, we budget a certain amount of overtime. And as I said, our, our budget people at the county level gave a very conservative number. For example, our, our costs, they budgeted an increase of 3% from year to year. Now, since most of that cost is personnel cost, we know that county police officers will not be seeing 3% raises from year to year through the life of, of this proposed contract. So that number is highly conservative, and it's and other than in the event of some catastrophic event that put overtime to it, it's highly unlikely that we would break that budget. Captain Craig, do we have a fixed price or a budget estimate? <laughs> Catastrophes notwithstanding. I think, I, can I answer? I think that both groups have been very, very diligent on putting together a number, looking at the history of the town, looking at what, uh, what the, what the tr trends have been over the last years, what their ex expertise is as police officers, and that the numbers will come in co close to their projected amount, hopefully in favor of the town, because we're the town board, we're going to say that, but, uh, but uh, you know, in, but you can't say, I don't think Maybe you can say. Well, I, I'll be honest, I'm a Village of Austin resident. I don't want him to say, hell or high water, we're coming at one million nine, and you have, we have a catastrophe in the town. So, so you have to understand that these are the numbers that they project to come in on, unless there is, God help us, anything major happen. We went through Sandy, and I want to compliment the county. We went through Sandy, and I'm sure the, and we all were in the rooms together, right? We did all our liaisons together, the county, you know, we had, rep Nick came down, and uh, Lieutenant, I should call him Nick here, um, the, um, came down, we had county police officers there, we had village police officers there, we had town administrators there, and we made it through that year within our budgeted amount that we were supposed to, uh, that they had projected that we would use. So we're very confident in these numbers. However, if something happens, you can't say to the village of Austin or the Westchester County, oh my God, you can't, you can't charge us a penny more because someone is going to absorb those costs. But that doesn't mean that it's not a discussion. That doesn't mean that you don't sit down and go over all the numbers with them and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Well, since I'm paying for the police cost, I'd like to know what the cost is. So once again, catastrophes notwithstanding, okay? Is the number the fixed number? It's my understanding that it is, yes. Okay, so that's a difference from what I'm hearing. Um, from no, that's not the difference at all. Their number is their fixed number, no catastrophes, as, as is in the village. But I heard that at the end of the year, you add up all your numbers and you see where you were, and... Well, I would hope that, I would hope that if the village had a savings, or the town and or the village that they would that they would we would sit down and look at all the numbers together and that would then be uh, reflected in the budgets so okay. thank next, you sir next question um, we don't exactly live in a high in a high crime district yet where each proposal was budgeting for one full-time detective 
Is there really enough work of detecting for one? As, as I answer, Can I have the police department answer that? Well, I just want to answer that I did answer this in an email to you, Mr. Gershner. And one of the things that you do have to remember, that you may not use a detective week to week, but if you have a crime or a something happened within your community, your detective services will be used up. might not be one person, it might be two or three detectives used at the same time. Did you want to speak on this? Yeah, and that's what the... Is the, there enough detecting to keep one detective working full time? Like, like Supervisor Zahn was saying, it's not one detective. It's one detective's worth of hours. When they process a crime scene, it is one detective. When they have a, a big case or got a bit of fatality car accident, it isn't one person investigating. Does that cover it for the course of the year? Yeah, I think it does. Okay, fine. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. If you, um, some people that regularly come to our meetings know that usually people line up against that. <laughs> and they want to, so, Ellen? Ellen Redak, Kahan, and B3, the non drive. Uh, town board hasn't seen me in a while, and one of the reasons is because of the police department. Um, shortly after they were hired, they, at my request, came over and did some sound reading so that we would know from the noise level what was 65 decibels, so that we could judge when there was an issue and when a neighboring property was above the limit. Um, there was an issue the other weekend. It wasn't there complaining to the board because the town police, well, the police department was there within 10 or 15 minutes and it was taken care of very quickly. They listened. They knew that if we could hear it on my deck, it was above the level. They went over. The noise was quieted. That is one of my two concerns. Whether it's the village or whether it's the county, that we get this rapid response to these quality of life issues. If noise issues aren't addressed fairly quickly, after an hour and a half, you might as well not come. Our house becomes no longer enjoy to live in. And, you know, you come after the noise is over, it does no good. So that response is very important to us, whoever is doing it. And the second is that whichever police department it is not become involved in political footballs, whether it be between the village and the town, the town and residents, whatever that that independence be maintained. That is critical for any police department to be effective and be respected in the community. Now, I will state up front, I've never seen this town board in Royal Police Department do these political games. In the past, I've seen hints of that. And I will not even say whether it's just the town or the village, it doesn't need to be said, and this isn't the only community where there have been issues. But those are my two concerns as you consider which department to use. Well, I want to just point out to you that um, when you're dealing with police services, there's a police, co the town board or the village board in this particular instance are police commissioners. So they're the ones that deal directly with the police departments, you know. So we would deal with the police department, whether it, whether it be either one, and one-on-one -on -one with them. So it's not, uh, it's not, it's not multiple levers, levels that you have to go to. Hi, uh, Paul C. Jones, 74 Bridal Path in the town of Austin. Uh, in the county's presentation, there was a slide that, uh, sh that showed the uh, additional services provided, <coughs> um, such as uh, canine unit. Yeah, sure. Such as canine unit, bomb, bomb squad, helicopters, etc. Um, those services, to my understanding, are available. Uh, to the village of Austining, also or to the town of Austining, as well as you know all other uh, cities and villages within Westchester, as well as outside of Westchester. If the vill if the town decides to go with the village, will those services still be available? Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, one of the things we said before is that Westchester County is second line support for all communities. And I didn't know it was outside Westchester County, but it's definitely inside Westchester County. Mm -hmm. 
Good evening. My name is Lou Ronaldi. When I go on the road, I'm from New York. Uh, I don't go through the bed much because I don't buy I'm not with beds and if uh, one dollar more, I lose it. So, uh, the question is, we talk in savings, which was me, has a lot of savings. It sounds like a lot cheaper than a county, which is, they do a good job, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think it's more uh, convenience for village Boston to be close to the town, which is with one police department, and uh, the officer right in town, I've been here for almost 40 years, and uh, I think that put it all together, I think it's not so much better offer the village of Boston than the county. Uh, I got much to say about it, but uh, the safety is good, sounds good, convenience is good, the guys are great, and uh, they do a good job, and I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Damiano, one white part drive, town outside. It's like I take a poll of the, uh, the town board and who lives in the uh, unincorporated area and who doesn't. Well, as everyone knows, the uh, four of us live in the village of Austin. But, Is that right? Okay. But I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that we have done an outstanding job for the uh, unincorporated area. And to be honest with you, to be honest with nice you. Nice people. Interrupted me. Okay. Right. So now, uh, you, you let the previous supervisor, Captain Borger, decide what's good for the community, the town, the, uh, the town outside. At the time, there was only one board member, okay, that was living in the unincorporated. We got one right now. Okay. So now you got four people here who are deciding what's good for the safety and welfare. Okay, for the town outside, all right? I think that's wrong. And then also, the town board saw fit a couple, a couple of years ago that they were going to bring up a voter referendum for the town highway superintendent. Okay, that town highway superintendent. But yet, the town board decided to vote on their own without giving a referendum to the residents, the unincorporated area, to vote on the police department. Yet, they decided that they were going to vote for a highway superintendent and whether it should be decided by the, the, the board or not. I think that's wrong. You should leave it for a voter referendum to the residents that live in the unincorporated area. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Good evening, how's everyone doing tonight? Uh, my name is Aaron Zimmerman. Um, I'm a resident of Austin. I'm also a detective in the village. I'm also our PBA president. And I just wanted to let the public know, uh, the town board know, that the men and women who I represent as you know, the head of our PBA, um, we're in full support of our department's proposal. The county, they're a great department. We work hand in hand with them every day since I've been here. Um, nothing bad to say about them, top notch agency, as are we. And I just want to emphasize um, the residents that we all live amongst make up the majority of our police department. Uh, the majority of our police department are village and town residents that have gone through the school systems. We have all of our children are in all of the Austin awesome school systems who are still residents. And um, I think it's important for the community to know that we are that entrenched in the community, not only living among everyone, working with everybody, and having our children grow up from park school right through the high school. And I just think it's uh, an important point to make, that uh, we're in support, and win, lose, or draw, just as long as the community you know, benefits from all this, I think that's the most important. Linda A. McDaniel, Austin Village, New York. I'd like to thank, thank the county and Austin Village's very fine police department for wonderful information to provide us. 
First and foremost, and I've always been, I look at the Bible study. I read over, read over thoroughly both proposals, and the major difference I see, of course, is the village of Austin is 2.8 million less than the county. Those are big dollars. That's over the um, four-year contract. They're both quite similar, except I noticed that the village of Austin will supply animal control. And Mr. Longworth, it's not in your contract. Animal control, very important to me. <laughs> Wasn't in the request for proposals, that's why we're discussing. Oh, okay. That's a logical answer. Um, I think money talks the most. They're both, it's, it's mixing oranges and oranges, not apples and bananas. Um, I learned a new word tonight, truing up. Does that mean, let's just use the figure one million. If a contract is guesstimated at a million, and they come in at half a million at year end, does the town get a refund of a half million? No. I'm just making up. Yeah, if, if, let's say if it was a million and it came in at 995,000, <laughs> um, okay. you would get, the town would not be charged the, okay. uh, yeah. On the other hand, you don't get a refund, you don't pay for that. On the other hand though, so if the contract's a million and it comes in that the village or the county spent a million and a half, does the county or the village get reimbursed that overage? Well, that's, that would only happen in a, in a catastrophe, like okay, we spoke about. And, and to be honest with you, we meet all the time, which we, we would do with either of the forces that we have working on. Okay. Um, that's a new word. I never heard the word showing up. I learned it. <laughs> I'd like to know approximately how many calls for the town outside did the county respond to in the year 2013? Sorry, I'm sorry. How many calls did the county of Westchester Police Department respond, respond to the town outside for the year 2000? I don't have the numbers right in front of me, so we don't even want to get the other one. Okay, it's a little over 11,000. 11,000. 11,000 calls. Does that mean that you responded? that you, you sent a vehicle out with a police officer to 11,000 uh, 11, different times, or are you including just telephone calls? There's a mix of both, it's that, and also self-initiated. Okay. So like if an officer uh, makes a traffic stop, or if an officer uh, <coughs> comes across the tree down, obviously it's somebody to call that in, but they come across it, it counts as a, as a job or radio. Okay, or let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. Okay. Okay. How many calls did the county of Westchester receive from residents of the town outside? And of those calls, how many, how many times did an officer in a patrol car respond? I'd have to look that up, I don't know off the top of my head. But you wouldn't say it's, I, 11,000, right? No, it would be 11,000. Do you do have the number, sir? We do have it, yeah. What is your last name? Alonji, A-L-O-N-G-I. I'll give you my card. <laughs> I'll go to later to my mailbox. <laughs> 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 I spoke with you on the phone. Yes, you did. But you had a wonderful officer who saw me in distress, had me back up, and actually showed me how to get back to Austin for more for You remember? Yes, I still praise that man. I thank you for your officers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Next. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Mark Candy. I live at 19 Downey Road. I uh, try to keep this short. I want to thank the village police and the county police for coming tonight. Uh, one thing I heard earlier was that the, if the village takes over the town of Austin, they would have to hire five new police officers. And that one of the reasons that the costs were so low was due to the fact that these new officers' salaries would be much lower than a more senior police officer. If uh, the numbers were calculated due to the fact that these newer police officers will be patrolling, is that, is that what I understood, that these new police officers that would be hired by the village will then be patrolling this kind of Austin? And, uh, yeah, I'll start with that question. No, they wouldn't be patrolling this kind of Austin. Uh, They'd be mixed in with Captain, everybody you else. must use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> No, they wouldn't. They'd be mixed in with the entire department. But 
we just felt philosophically that we, should, because it was the town's RFP, we should pass all those savings on to the town itself. So. One more question on that. Um, were, the, uh, were the numbers uh, that were proposed, were those numbers calculated on an average police officer salary, or is that the, uh, the new five officers that would be hired, was that their starting salary at a forty or $50,000 rate as opposed to a more senior police officer? Yes, it was. It was, it was calculated on the lower salary. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, Steve Jenny. I live at Deerfield Condominiums. That's in the town outside. Uh, on the subject of uh, community policing and kids, uh, police officers in schools, um, I personally know maybe half of the Austin Village police officers. And I know that they are well respected everywhere, uh, in the, either in the town or the village, because a lot of the kids are going to village schools, if we can call them that, and they eventually graduate into the town schools, if we can call those two schools or St. Augustine's as one of them. I've never seen a police department respected as much as the guys from the village amongst the kids in the community. I spend a lot of time at the Osmond High School, and I see the village police there often. None of those kids would dare go up against a police officer when a police officer tells them what to do because the kid that's sitting next to them would tell them, hey, we don't mess with the police officers in the village because they're such good guys. And I know a lot of them personally, and I know they are. A question on the dispatch. Um, I am a life member of OVAC, very proud of that. Does the county dispatch OVAC directly? No. 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 So the call has to go into the county. Uh, go ahead, I'll give you a minute. It goes to the county dispatch, and then somebody has to notify the Austin Police Department. So once again, I, it depends on the call. Are you referring to a cell phone call or a landline? If I wanted to, if I picked up the phone in my house and I wanted to call uh, the county police, I wouldn't probably call 911 because, or is it not true that I may get connected to a state police dispatcher first? Or is that only on cell? No, only on cell. Cell okay. phone calls will go to the TMC. Okay. That's where they're, then they're sent out to the TNC to uh, various people. So if I call from a cell from 9 a.m. 1.34, and I got it routed, routed to the TMC, would the TMC then have to call the county, and then the county call OSME to dispatch the ambulance? The TMC will, if, I can't speak to the TMC dispatchers down there. If they know that it is within the confines of the village, they will send a call to the Okay, village. but I'm in, I'm in the town. Yes. 90 and 134 is in the town. Then they will send a call to us. And then you would call? And then the call will be routed back okay. for fire and EMS, Austin dispatchers then. All right, question I really... Now, I, I have been on the calling end as well as the receiving end of many of those calls, be it whether I'm driving for OVAC or whether I need OVAC. And I know when I call the village of Austin that when that call is going to be dispatched, 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, the dispatcher knows where I am. In other words, if I'm at Deerfield Condominiums and I tell her I need an ambulance at the Deerfield Condominiums, they're going to get the ambulance there. Now, if I'm a new driver at OVAC and a call comes in to your dispatch and you need an ambulance on Ganong Road or Ganong Drive, maybe your dispatcher doesn't know where Ganong Drive is. And maybe because the 
person who's riding for OFAC is new and they don't know where Gnome Drive is. Can how do you just how do you route that person? This is uh, I, I think I lost you a little bit. So the call comes in via a landline. Yes, yeah, say it's a landline, and the caller is on Gnome Drive. Okay, and you'll dispatch. Okay, something something Gnome Drive. They dispatch the ambulance. Suppose there's a new person on the ambulance because not all of the ambulance persons live in in Austin anymore. Can your dispatch direct that vehicle to well, Gun Drive? Well, this is, goes back to what we said. We're going to dispatch a police car that's going to, going to go there. Mm -hmm. Austin Village is dispatching all that. Okay, okay, you can. Yeah, it's, it's our responsibility as a primary dispatch of OVAC to get them to get on drive. So once the county police has called us and asked us, asked us to dispatch them to get on, and if your, uh, if your OVAC driver doesn't know where Ganong is uh, and asks us to direct them, then we would give them directions to get on drive. We also, you know, um, OVAC on the rigs, they keep our police frequency on their rigs. So we, we converse mostly on our police frequency after we initially dispatch. Okay, so all I really want to say is that the Austin Village Police is the right choice for the town outside of Austin. I mean, even their fill-up facility is in the town of Austin. They go through 9134 to get to their facility down there. God forbid there's a very bad accident on, on 9As at 134. Nine times out of ten, the county's there first. But there are occasions where the county, that car, may be tied up on another call. And the first responder is the village of Austin because they have four or five sector cars or whatever out on the road that they can back. Um, my personal contact with the Westchester County Police has been excellent. Uh, I have been, I have cause to call them. Um, the minute I say I'm hastening, they, they get it. Um, I haven't had a, a dialogue issue with response to where we are, um, and the response has been good. I absolutely believe that the village of Austin could do a great job. Um, and this is gonna be an extremely hard uh, decision for me. And so to the gentleman who was asking for a referendum, we can't do that. It would cost money, there's not a time, and we probably can't do it legally. So barring that, my question to the community is, how do we get enough people to give information as to what they're really thinking and want? And I mean, at this point, you've had, you've received how many emails? Probably about 10. 5,500 people in the unincorporated town of Boston. We, gotten 10, maybe we'll get some more. We're your board, we're here to listen, we're here to understand, to know the wants, the issues, the concerns. We can't do that in a vacuum. And I live in this town and I know that when decisions are made sometimes, then later on people say, well, we shouldn't have done it. But the question is, where, where are we when the decisions need to be made? So I implore you, speak to your neighbors, speak to your family, contact us. All of our emails are on the website. My name is Kim Jeffrey, you can look me up. I work on 2 Church Street, you can find me. The, su the supervisor is there, she's there almost every day, mostly long day. Um, we're around, so please let us know what everybody's thinking. And whatever those questions are, we will reach out to these two departments and ask them additional questions. And I again want to thank you both. So again, we're going to leave those emails and letters. Uh, this is, was the presentation night. Um, the, the, village, uh, the, the town board will be meeting um, again on this in a couple of weeks. We have a 
Uh, next week we have a regular legislative session, and uh, we have then we have actually have the fifth Tuesday off this month. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there someone that wants to speak? Absolutely, sir. Thank you, John Connolly, 11 McCarthy Drive. Uh, Mr. Connolly, could you, could you bring that Sorry. Up? Thank you. The 11 McCarthy Drive, Austin. I'm fourth generation native of Austin. And I would like to say I think that the county police is a fine department, and I think they've done a good job. And my own father, in fact, is a retired officer from the Westchester County Police. But along with Mr. Rinaldi, I think there's a, a continuity and a convenience factor in having police consolidated with the village and I'd like to throw my endorsement and, that, and urge the town to consider approving Austin's proposal. Okay, so I think what we'll do now, and if you gentlemen are more than welcome to stay for the next few minutes because you can learn a little bit about uh, reassessment. We're doing <laughs> we're doing a uh, we're doing a, a townwide reassessment um, here in Austin, along with uh, along with uh, Greenberg and Yonkers, Yonkers, right? Because I'm not losing my mind, right? And North Salem. Sure, we're going to take a one minute break and then we'll continue with that. Thank both police departments. We have been coordinating with them in this effort. Uh, they have all the information on the data collection team that is out there, as well as their supervisor and all the proper identification. Uh, we haven't had any issues yet. Very few complaints. Uh, the entry rate has been kind of low, and give you a quick uh, impression of my take uh, because of the vacation period. And of course, we are in the in the Indian village section where we started, and then we got to go on to the northern part of the village and then south towards the village uh, center, and then the south end, the historic district. That's the plan. Of course, the plan is subject to change based on needs and staffing requirements, but without any further ado, I'll let Melissa Bear from Tyler Technologies give you uh, more details. Thank you all for staying. <laughs> I'm a little dejected, though, to be honest. <laughs> but that's okay. Because it's so late, I'm going to be really interesting, or at least very brief. So we're going to talk a little bit about the reassessment project, which is about, um, really only about two months old. We started data collection just a month ago. But here's where we are in the project. One of our main focuses at the beginning of the project is our public information campaign, because one of the MMRC, which stands for Multiple Municipal Reassessment Consortium, so you'll hear me talk about the consortium. And one of our goals is transparency and a commitment to the highest level of public information. And to that end, we mail out brochures. So some of you may have already received one. If you're in a new village, I certainly hope that you have. If you haven't, then um, you should be getting it. Sorry, quick fingers. Um, seven to ten days prior to a data collector being in your area, you will receive a brochure, which you know, because I just showed you, is on the next slide. You will know the data collectors are in your area because they wear bright, hideous vests that say Tyler Technologies on them. So I bet our police officers have come across them, and so that's who they are, and that's how you know who, who those people are. They're wearing those vests. They also have IDs. We have their pictures and car information on our website. Is a little touchy. So we have a website, which I'm also going to show you on a future slide, and we update it with lots and lots of information about the project, including pictures of our data collectors. We have a video, which I'm going to show a little screen print of, and uh, press releases and various information. We also have held many, many meetings, in addition to the one right now. This is the brochure. We have mailed approximately 1,000 of these. Uh, we just mailed out a good batch in the last couple of days, so that thousand probably haven't hit the mailboxes. This is what it looks like. It may look like some junk mail. It does say important reassessment information. It has frequently asked questions about the project. Um, so please don't throw it away. This is your indicator. Someone's going to be knocking on your door pretty soon. This is our website. MMRC.TylerTech.com is the address. Don't use www, it won't work. We put a lot of effort into this website, and I hope that you will take a look at it. 
frequently because we update it nearly daily. We have a Town of Austining portal that has information specific to Austining, including some street listings of where our people are at, um, as well as a homepage that has consortium uh, information. So we have press releases. We have a Why Do We Need Reassessment video, which I have that screen print over there. It's about eight minutes long. We've actually presented it at a few of our public meetings. It is in both English and Spanish. So please take a look at it. You can watch the whole eight minute chunk or you can watch various sections of it. So for instance, we have one that's just specific to data collection, which is where we're at right now. So if you don't want to spend eight minutes, you can just spend two. We have a calendar of events listing. So it's gonna tell you any of the public meetings that we have today. We're actually on a tail end and we don't have very many left to do. So, uh, but we do keep that up to date on a weekly basis. We have the public presentations. Tomorrow, I'll have this one up there. So we do do a lot of the same presentations over and over again. So even though we've done about 20 of them, you'll see about four or five different unique presentations that we have done. Uh, we also have the street listings of the data collector locations. And again, data collector information, what cars they drive, what their license plate numbers, and a nice picture so you know who these people are. You can verify it and on the website. You can also call Fernando if you want some further confirmation of who these people are. They'll have a letter that's signed by him authorizing that person to do this work for, on his behalf. This is a copy of our street listing. So the way we work this is we'll make two attempts at every property. And so we do cover a pretty wide area during a one week period of time because we're gonna be in some areas during the daytime hours doing a first call. That's our first attempt at getting the information for your property. The first attempt is when we measure the outside and we do that whether you're home or not. The second attempt we make is gonna be after 5 p.m. or on Saturday. And I will tell you that right now we are only working on Saturdays. So uh, those second visits are primarily happening on Saturday. Those are all the meetings that we've done. So we've done a lot. We've done our very best to try to get the word out about this project. And if you haven't been able to attend one, as I said, there are uh, the presentations themselves are available on our website. We've spoken to many condo associations. And in fact, we're doing one tomorrow if you're interested. So our website, we track how many people come and visit our website. So we're very proud of our website. And we had 2,400 plus or minus visits to our website. And you can see the chart that the majority, the blue color is, is new visitors and the green are returning visitors. And I can't read that, but I know one of them is in the 20% and one must be in the 70%. So it also tells us what countries they come from, and believe it or not, uh, they're not all in the United States, so it's kind of interesting. This is our data collection entry statistics. Um, it's, it's kind of sad, actually. <laughs> We're only getting into 28% of our houses on the first two attempts. So what is that you know, based on? Well, people work. People are on vacation. So, have no fear, we'll send you a postcard, bright yellow postcard that you'll get in the mail that's gonna ask you to make an appointment. So if you're not home, uh, please give us a call, make an appointment so that we can finish the inspection so that we can collect all that data that we really, really need in order to come up with accurate valuations. So we are, as you can see, we have not done any appointments because we are not at that phase yet. Uh, we have not done all of our second visits because um, NOAH, no one at home. So we have about 600, second visits we have to do, we've only done 182 of those because we're only doing them on Saturdays. So we still have some, a lot of second attempts to make. We hope we're gonna pick up. This is really low. This is really low for New York. This is really low in my experience. We typically get into about 35% of our first calls and the second call is right about historically what I get. So I don't know if we're just hitting a lot of people on vacation or what it is, but that is actually pretty low for, in my expectation. Um, we have very few people refusing, and I wanna thank you for that, because it, it makes our job much easier, it makes the whole process fairer and more equitable for everyone. If we're able to collect all that information, we don't have to estimate, we don't have to guess, we can get the information right the first time. So that is where we are. We've collected about 868 properties that we visited for the first time, and that's, our statistics. So quality control is really important to us. 
Uh, we want to make sure that the people that are coming through your house are doing what we're paying them to do and that they're doing it accurately because, as I just told you, accurate data leads to accurate valuations. So we have a field supervisor that works with our crew. He is out in the field. His name is Ian Fuller. Uh, he's got really pretty long hair, so if you see the guy with the long hair, that's the field supervisor. Uh, he has relisted, so he goes and redoes all the measurements. He'll go back through the house if you allow him to and if someone home. He's done that on 87 properties, or about 10%. Our contract requires us to do 3%. Uh, so we do a little bit more at the beginning because some of these people have never done this work before. So we want to make sure that they're doing it right and that we're getting good data. And I can tell you that I am over the moon about my statistics because we have an average passing score. Um, it, it certainly isn't rocket science what we do, but it, it is difficult. Um, it's, it's something different that most people don't learn at school. You don't learn in fourth grade or anything how to list a property for, for appraisal purposes. Um, so our crew here, two of which I believe are from Austin, Anthony and Chris Chen Lee are both from Austin. Um, all of our scores are really, really good, so we're doing a good job here. So we don't have a lot of errors occurring, and that should make everybody feel good. It certainly makes me feel good. So where we go next? Uh, once we've collected the data, and as you can see, we're really, really early into this process, but we're going to start dividing the town into valuation er areas. And what you see over there is a picture of how you do this if you don't have a computer. You get out your marker, and you draw it. Uh, we're going to use some GIS technology, we're going to talk to realtors, and we're going to start organizing and dividing the town into valuation area, areas. And what that means is, what areas are going to have a similar type of value? Which ones have similar amenities, similar housing stock? Um, so it may be proximity to or views of the river, certainly that's going to impact value. Um, what school district you're in, if you have more than one. Are you close to a train station? All of those things, major highways, major roads, those are impactors of value. And you can even see there's clusters of housing that were probably all built at, at a similar period of time, and those make up a valuation neighborhood. This is something that, was, that the town has been using, uh, Fernando and his staff have been using over time. So obviously they're a great resource for us. Nobody knows the town better than them. The next thing we're gonna do is look at sales, properties that have sold in the last two years. We're going to start looking at those properties closely, making sure that all those sales are arm's length transactions, meaning that they were fair market sales between a willing buyer and seller, not family members or anything funny like that. Um, and that's where we're going to be, but we'll be data collecting through March of next year. And now, questions? Anybody? <laughs> So you have two questions. One is you mentioned that it's, uh, and correct me because I didn't hear the exact one. I'm either the first visit or the second visit, or you're having trouble getting, you know, finding people at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I have had occasion to knock on many doors, um, and I find that typically people in Austin are not home for many reasons: uh, two-income families. Um, People like to get out and do things. They go out and children have sports. So Saturdays you might not find. So my question is, um, if this becomes a continuing trend, if it's not just that it's the summer and people are away, if you get into September and people are back but they're out a lot because of things, how do you mitigate that? Because you're saying that you're probably gonna end your data collection in March, correct? Unfortunately, it, you know, unless people invite us into their homes or allow us into their home, there's really nothing we can do to, to really mitigate it. So what we're going to do is we're going to send out those letters. I can tell you we generally get a good response. Uh, we get a good percentage because most people want to do what's right and they want to get this inspection done. Um, so we, because there are so many more people not home, we'll be sending out more letters than we're, we're normally sending out and we expect, expect to get more uh, appointments. But because we may have to estimate some more information, we'll be sending out data mailers. So once we've done all the inspections and some, everyone's had the opportunity to make that appointment, they're gonna get a property inventory sheet, it's called a data mailer. 
and it's got the information that we've collected. So if that information isn't correct, we're going to give them an opportunity, even if it is correct, to make an inspection appointment at that time as well. So that will be the fourth opportunity that you will have. And if the information is not correct, we're going to insist, unfortunately, that that inspection take place so that we can verify that that information is accurate. Um, so that will be the fourth attempt. So typically for most of my career, I've been doing this about 14 years, we get around 70%. So what I'm hoping is that where we're lacking the 10% on the first call, we'll get that many more in appointments. And if we have to estimate, then we may have to make more appointments on the data mailer end um, to, to get all that inf information accurate before we start valuation. And my second question is you mentioned um, at, at later on, I think with, when you talked about the mapping part or the neighborhood valuation part, I don't, I don't remember the verbiage used, then you'd be talking to real and so my question is, so we have a lot of realtors in the house. How do you determine what realtors you're speaking to? How do you choose from that? So the ones that are willing? Oh, is that what it is? is yeah. It? yeah, we talked to Hagar, um, H-G-A-R. <laughs> We've already talked to them. If there's ones that are, um, you know, Fernando knows personally, um, but really we're, we're interested in, in opinions of people who, who do this every day of, of their, you know, their lives. They're going to know where those lines be drawn. Um, so we're certainly going to give it a, a good, good go at it based on sales information, based on Fernando and Al's experience. Um, and then we're going to ask those people to come in. And, you know, we're, we're open to, I mean, it's just a map. So we're open to anybody's opinion. So if you know realtors and you want to get the word out, um, I'm, I'm open to any and all uh, advice and help that we can get. Yeah. Uh, we know a lot of realtors that constantly come to our office for information, doing their due diligence when they're listing or selling a house. Uh, in addition to the meetings that you saw on, up on the board, I have, I have been having meetings in the realtor's office where I get 40 to 50 realtors, such as Pulaham, Lawrence, Caldwell Banker, uh, and I'm open to go to any, any of the other realtor's office that I haven't been to. We also did a meeting with the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors in White Plains, where we had what, about 80 realtors there from throughout the county. Uh, it was a, 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 a reassessment presentation, and also the other assessors from the other communities, Tyler and Hagerman, also uh, participated in that meeting. But we are uh, reaching out to the realtors. Many of them, of course, uh, are the ones that are able to explain to the residents what's going on and as part of their due diligence when they're selling or listing a house, uh, they need to let their customers know that this valuation re reassessment process is going on. So in addition to that, uh, we have several realtors on, on the board of assessment review who are very knowledgeable, local realtors, and we have quite a few. One thing I must say that we have a very good group of very competent realtors, not, on, not only residential, but commercial realtors. So I just wanted to uh, point out that I did have uh, my house done. Um, we thought it was very, very important. If you go on my Facebook page, it is my profile picture of the uh, gentleman, gentleman <laughs> shaking hands with my husband as he was uh, as he was entering into the house. And I will tell you that the whole process, including the external measuring of the house and the whole process inside the house, not to say I have a big house, but it took no more than 10 minutes. Um, and they're very, very professional, and from what the feedback that we're getting from all of the residents, because it is residential that's happening now, is that they've been nothing but uh, very, very professional, and uh, they're doing a great job. I will say, and we talked about this at the beginning when, we, when it was determined that, um, especially a community like Indian Village would be the first section. It is a lot of dual income. We are going over the 4th of July holidays, people are away, you can tell the difference in the driving. And uh, so we'll all work together, but uh, we want to assure everyone that it's a, it's a harmless process and we didn't want to take any chances that anybody didn't know, so we went and we took pictures while they were doing my house, and they, so everybody knows that they went and did the reassessment, so I'm for this 100%, and I think it's very important that everybody cooperate 
um, with the with the people. And someone said it perfectly. Um, these are people that are doing just a job. You know, don't kill the messenger out there. So be kind to these people. Let them in. Let them do their job. And let's move on so that in 2016 we can have a true 100% valuation of our community. And that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yes. Uh, Maria Carey, Cliff Drive, Crowley Um I just. Uh, you need a microphone. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you. I just like if you could walk us through this. So they're going to come and they're going to measure the outside of your house. Right. Okay. Then they're going to walk through. Now, you know, what is it like? They have a clipboard and say, okay, you have three bedrooms, one and a half bath. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly what happens. They have this cool tape measure that they spin around your house and they and they know where the crevices are, you know, the dips in and stuff. So they do the measurement of your house and outbuilding. So you have a garage or shed or something, they'll do that too. And then they go in and they go, okay, you have a living room, a dining room, how many bedrooms do you have? That's what they're really they're looking for. They're looking for how many bedrooms, how many baths, is your, is your basement, um, I almost called it a cellar, is your basement finished? Because my basement's not finished, so I call it a cellar. <laughs> so, 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 um, so they go down there. If you have attics and it's easily accessible to get up to the attics, they'll go up to the attic. I live in a Cape Cod. I don't have attics, so uh, it was a very quick walk through. So it was, it was quite painless, and all they're trying to do is say, um, in this particular neighborhood, these houses have all of these, they're very similar, the houses are gonna be very similar. And so we can get the true inventory of what's out there. If you, for instance, not you, but if someone had was a one-family house, and they had two kitchens, and they had two what, what could be perceived as two families living in the house. I'm not talking about you know the old kitchen in the basement type of thing, uh, but and it looked like they had, had two families living there. They're going to classify that as a two-family house. They don't really worry, and they can't worry because they're trying to move through these. And correct me if I say anything wrong. I've, I've been to enough of these presentations, so I can almost do this uh, in my sleep. Uh, but they, they don't, they're not worried about what the zoning is. You know, the, the building departments have had total access to these records after they're taken and everything. But what they're doing is they're just going in and checking if it's, they had two kitchens, it looks like two family, they're gonna make it a two family house, which is assessed differently than a one family house, right? So. Okay, and how about the property? I mean, our address is Cliff Drive. We were on a cliff. Right. We look at a flat map, and you know, you look like you have property, but how much of this is actually usable? Or we um, we look at we do some basic when the data collectors out there they're going to list things like topography. So is it level? Is it steep? Is it you know what kind of uh, topography is it? It's kind of a, a very generic overview. We're going to use GIS and we're going to take a look at wetlands maps contour maps that's going to show us that and of course as we're driving by and an appraiser looks at your property he's going to be able to see that you have a cliff in your backyard and we make adjustments for that based on properties that have similar topographical issues as your property has so basically everything that happens uh, per valuation we try to get from a sale so that we don't have to guess is it 10 percent of a value is it five percent of a value we try to quantify everything that we can so we can say well on this property this is what it meant in a sale price and so we're going to do the same thing for your property but we try to use technology whenever possible because technology is always going to be better than somebody you know going like that and trying to guess what you know what part of your yard is usable versus what isn't i see so in other words you're assessing the house and the property. Yes, and everything that you would sell, if you put your house on the market, um, fee simple interest, it's the, you know, the, the land that your, their, your house sits on. Um, if you have a condo, then you don't have land. So whatever you would sell um, as your property is what we do. So we have that information from um, the records that says it's 0.23 acres or two acres or whatever it is. So whatever amount of land you have, all of the improvements on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have a question? Thank you. Hi. Um, Tom Warren, I'm the uh, time controller, and this was an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting presentation, but I had a question on the slide. 
that uh, pertain to what oh, seemed to be the, the, the slide that seemed to be scoring of the work done by the um, inspectors, that one? That one. Right. But I said five is considered passing, so does yes. that mean that on average the quality of the work done by the inspectors is, is considered failing? No, the five is considered passing, so six would be failing. So what it is, we're counting the number of errors that they make. And it isn't that they make four errors on average. Uh, different errors are scored differently. So if they miss the color of your house, that's half a point. If they miss uh, the, a bedroom, that's a point. If they don't measure it correctly, that could be up to five points. And that um, you know, has to be the, the, the supervisor. If they totally miss it, if they miss every measurement, they're going to give them a five right off the bat. Uh, if the property card isn't, isn't neat, if, they didn't hand, if their handwriting isn't neat, then they could get two points off for that. So some things are scored higher than others. Measurements are by far the ones that carry the most weight. Um, so they are all passing. Only Tanya um, has a score that, that is considered failing at 5.32 and it should have um, So, and, and the other thing is that all of these properties are now 100% accurate because of field supervisor. On top of this, that field supervisor reviews every single card. He doesn't relist every, every single one. He's only going to do a certain percentage, but he's in the field looking at it. So he's catching all kinds of errors. On top of that, we do edits to the computer database in which we can find errors that way. And that also help us with data entry errors, which also occur. So this is actually great in Greenberg. In Greenberg, our average score is 5.3. Um, we also have um, 20 data collectors in Greenberg, so um, so far so good. You know, it's really great. You know, Anthony 3.64. That's great. He's making on average only three errors, um, and chances are he's only really making one or two errors, and, and they're just highly weighted ones because that's typically what happens. Yeah, um, I would also like to point out that our monitor, who is the company that is assisting me in uh, reviewing. Uh, over, overviewing this whole process, will also be out there sampling a percentage of this uh, uh, work. Not 3% or 5%. In the initial phase of the project, of course, there will be a higher percentage of, of quality control checks. But as the project moves along and the data collectors are more experienced and we're more confident, then, of course, uh, there will be a lesser percentage of review and a higher, a higher uh, pace of uh, data collection. So. Once I have a quick question. You had, do I have a number of about 1,000 mailings? Are you only assessing 1,000 homes? Or? We send those uh, mailers out seven to 10 days prior. So we're mailing them in, in batches where we think we're gonna be next. So we've only mailed to the places we're expected to be in the next week or two. So we are going to assess every single property, every school, every church, every residential property, every condo, every property will be valued at 100% um, commercial properties, you know, industrial properties. One last question, um, how much is this assessment? Not to exceed 1.8 million. Okay. <laughs> 1.8 million. And mine is a fixed fee. <laughs> 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 okay. I just had a question. Hi, I'm Victoria Garrity. I'm a village trustee candidate for mayor. And my question is, we have a lot of tenants. Um, what is the policy if you go into a multifamily home and the tenant is there, how much, what is an appropriate response for someone who lives in a home but is not the home owner? I guess it depends on who you ask. Uh, we're gonna go in if someone lets us in. Now the, <laughs> the property owner may disagree with that and I can tell you we've seen a lot of that where they'll be like, ah, we didn't want you to go in there. We get um, probably about 50-50 where they'll say, okay, sure, come on in, you know, I don't care. And then they'll be like, no, no, you got to contact the property owner. So uh, when we knock on the door, obviously, we're going to get the tenant. When we mail the callback letters, when we mail those mailers, when we mail the data mailer, that all goes to the property owner's address. Back there.
Hi guys, I got a question from almost everybody now. Bill Zagarelli, who was manager for Ireland. Probably a very crazy question, but there's been a big drop in, we'll call it the perceived market value of homes. Large homes, even yeah, smaller homes too. Let's say a person who had, using the, the old equalization rate against the assessment, had a perceived market value of $2 million, but someone just bought the house for, let's say, $900,000. That indeed becomes the market value. What happens to that person when, they come in, when your folks come in and views it as potentially closer to the $2 million, but the person actually bought it in less than, let's say, 12, 15 months for significantly less. I know it sounds like a crazy question. No, that's a great it question. It leads into another question. No, no, it's a perfect question because, uh, generally speaking, a current sale price is, is the best measure of fair market value, but there's an asterisk there. Because we do mass appraisal, we actually have to look at every single sale and we build a model that values every property. And the reason that we do that is for equity and consistency. So we don't go down the street and say, well, this guy paid 900, this person was crazy, paid a million, this person you know, got a good deal, got 800,000, and they're all the same house. We don't do that. Even though those sale prices differ, we're gonna put 950,000 on every single house. So we weigh every sale equally. So it certainly is very good evidence, and, and we hope there isn't that much disparity in the market. Generally, there isn't, but I'm not going to hit every single sale on the nose. And every once in a while, there is a reason uh, that somebody does get a good deal. They just, you know, the person was in distress, they were going to lose their house, they were going through a divorce, and, you know, it really depends on, on how much supply and demand there is in, in the market. The more supply there is, you're going to, you're going to see that more, and, and when demand is higher, then you're going to see that less. And I know Fernando and I were just talking at the beginning of this meeting, saying that the sales are starting to pick up. The number of sales that he's getting through his office is starting to pick up, which means that demand is growing and supply is coming down. So we're going to see fewer of those outliers, I think. Um, but certainly, if it's an arc like transaction and, it, and it's you know similar to the other properties that have sold. Um, our 900,000, and I certainly hope that my value will be very close to 900,000. And we don't really look at the historical value because one of the reasons we do this project is because those are completely out of whack at this point. So we're using one equalization rate against every type of property, every commercial property, condo property, residential property, no matter where it is. And we know that properties change over time in a different way. So we know that those starting perceived market values, I like that, that word, um, we know that those are out of whack. That's the whole point of doing it. So to use that as, a, as any kind of benchmark is, is kind of like defeating the purpose. The, the second, it leads to the secondary question okay. I had is that under, in a previous lifetime, I've been through, well, gone through two weed outs. And the traditional, uh, how can I say it, common statement is, well, you know, one third stays the same, yeah. one goes up, and the other third goes up, and the other third goes down. Have you seen any trends that either reflect that very traditional uh, explanation that people give, or is it skewed one way or the other? And, and the reason why I say that is, despite what I, my first question, we also have many people in, in our community that, you know, they've lived there 40 years. And, you know, they bought their house uh, at a, you know, at the time was expensive, but you know, it, uh, and maybe they've done improvements or not, but it certainly doesn't reflect it would, when you talk about the one third, one third, one third. They're on the one third that would be expected to go up because it hasn't been looked at and distinctly that much versus the person who came in at a higher end, and that person should actually maybe go down if it's averaged out. The third, third, third green is in reference to taxes. So uh, because if, if you say the budget is, is just stable, which you know it'll go up from year to year as it does every other year, but just assuming that it stays the same, the amount that it, it, everybody's taxes don't go up. So everybody's assessments will probably go up, but everyone's taxes aren't going to go up. So it depends no on question, no question. what happens 
uh, between the markets. So yeah, we use a third and third, and, and most of the time it does. We did Scarsdale, which is a pretty different community, so I don't know how applicable it is to here, and it was 25% went up, 38% went down, and the remainder stayed roughly the same. So that's that's a little different. Uh, was it Marinette that did it? Um, they were a third, third, third. Um, so I don't know if that's a similar community. My company didn't do it. Uh, I've done a lot of work in Connecticut, and it really depends because it depends on the makeup of a community. If you've got waterfront, oceanfront, that property almost never goes down. Uh, if you have a lot of appeals where your commercial property, ta you know, the majority of your commercial property uh, owners have appealed and therefore making it a, a, a lower deflated value because, you know, they've gotten these appeals. So the answer is, yeah, right now our best guess is a third, a third, a third, but at some point during this project we're going to be able to answer that definitive, definitively what it is. Um, and it really depends on what the market's done. So what's the market done? You could do a little bit of that analysis now just by looking at the equalized, equalized value versus the sale price, and you could probably answer that question, you know, just on that analysis alone. I, I would just, I would confirm that you know, we've seen a pickup. You, you know, we see people coming in, looking on property cards, and uh, clearing things, and so on and so forth. So I would say there is a, there is a pickup, but. There was also, you know, several years where prices just really tumbled, and they haven't rebounded to, to the previous. And I, I just want to say that because I don't think we're unique. I think it's going to be the same in the town outside, the village of Austin, and I'm just looking to see what the trends are because from a budgetary point of view and, and a very, shall I say, emotional point of view, someone like myself and my counterparts we feel it very quickly to get the, the indicators. Thanks. Yeah, the properties that, you know, I hear that a lot, but in reality, the properties that haven't been maintained in the last 40 years aren't the ones that go up. I, I mean, it's almost guaranteed because those properties aren't in demand in the market. And so they're not going to be the most desirable. They're not going to be the most uh, appreciated in the market. So generally speaking, if you haven't maintained your house in 40 years or if you've just done a roof and a siding or whatever, um, chances are you're not going to be one of those people that sees a tax increase. But it's all, you know, it's all a guess at this point. I just want to point out that this reassessment project is to be implemented on the 2016 roll. So the valuation date for that will be July 1st, 2015. And for that we will be analyzing sales from 2013 to, two, so it's going to be pretty current. Uh, this year, the equalization rate went from 6.1 to 5.95 which indicates about a 4% improvement in market value based on the, on the analysis of the residential and commercial sales. So the market is picking up. Right now, I will say that most of the sales that are happening, particularly in the village of Briar Cliff Manor, are selling at above asset value. Uh, and one of the uh, nice things is that now I have realtors coming to me and saying, you know, uh, my clients are buying this house, and it's under assessed. And with doing this revaluation, the, the assessed value or the sale price is $300,000 more than the assessed value. Are they going to get an increase? And of course, that's a very difficult question to answer because we don't know where, where all the numbers are going to fall. Any other questions? So it's getting to be 10 o'clock, and I'm going to ask you to watching a very interesting presentation from the uh, uh, village of Austin and uh, Westchester County on the police services. So we're very excited. Uh, I thought they were excellent professional, as yours always are, but we have gone to so many together, uh, 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 presentations tonight. And we want to remind everyone that if you have any comments to make uh, concerning the police services for uh, the unincorporated area of Austin, uh, please send us an email to, uh, you can look it up on the webpage as Councilwoman uh, Jeffrey said, or you can uh, just send it to S. Donnelly and we'll disperse it amongst us all. Um, S. Donnelly at townofaustin.com. You want to drop off a letter, we're on the third floor, or you can send it in the U.S. mail. So we encourage all people in the unincorporated area to give us their feedback. And uh, one thing we want to make perfectly clear is that that's why we're going through this process. The reason we're going through this process of having the two 
groups make the presentation and ha having this transparent um, discussion about the police services be is because we want to hear from the people in the, the unincorporated area because we think it's very important. Um, so have a wonderful week. 16 Croton Avenue, third floor, that's the municipal building. Um, so have a great week and uh, stay dry. Be careful of flooding waters. I understand it's raining out now. Um, it's going to rain all night, so don't drive through deep puddles. It's not safe. And, uh, or don't drive through puddles if you don't know how deep they are either. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. We will be at the courthouse for our legislative meeting. Um, that will be our last meeting in July. We do have a Tuesday night off in July, and I promised everyone we wouldn't have any special meetings. So uh, I want to thank you all, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Have a wonderful week. Thanks.